The antagonist of the movie is 10-year-old Michael Myers from Illinois. He has a difficult life, both at home and at school, because of his shy and weird nature. To make matters worse, his mother, Deborah, is one of the most desirable strippers in the city. One weird thing about this kid is that he kills and dissects animals while hiding behind a Halloween clown costume. His most recent victim is his pet mouse. One day, while Michael is engaged in his odd behavior, we see his mother Deborah preparing food for the family. It is revealed that her boyfriend, Ronnie, is loud ill-tempered alcoholic and aggressive to her. He makes rude comments about Deborah's teenage daughter, Judith, and infant daughter Boo. The little girl always starts crying as soon as Ronnie raises his voice. Meanwhile, Michael comes downstairs, wearing his clown mask and announces that his pet mouse has died. His mother comforts him and promises to buy a new one, but she doesn't ask about the cause of the rodent's death. Just then, Ronnie tells the kid to remove his clown mask and when Michael refuses, he yanks it off his face. Later that day at school, Michael encounters a bully named Wesley Rhodes and his friend in the washroom. They torment him by making nasty comments about his mother being a stripper. Understandably, Michael becomes upset and begins yelling shut up while battling the bullies alone. Their scuffle is eventually ended when the principal enters the washroom and shouts at them. However, an irate Michael curses at the principal landing himself into greater problems and all three kids getting detention. In no time, Deborah arrives at the school, but instead of scolding her son, she yells at the principal calling him irresponsible. Scott the latter makes her understand that Michael is a special child. He even schedules an appointment with Dr. Sam Loomis a child psychologist. Later, during the meeting the doctor shows Deborah evidence of Michael's abuse of animals and informs her that her son displays signs of sociopathology. It turns out the principal had found a dead cat in Michael's school bag. A collection of images showing various animal mutilations were also discovered. Dr. Loomis mentions that these are warning indicators and that only a disordered mind could take delight in such violent acts. In the meantime, Michael runs from school and stumbles upon the bully, Wesley in the woods. Out of nowhere, he strikes him with a large branch of a tree. As Wesley falls to the ground, Michael lets out all of his anger and hits him with blow after blow. Poor Wesley, who is in pain and in tears, begs Michael to stop hurting him. However, the monstrous boy only becomes more aggressive and ends up killing Wesley. That evening, Michael returns home and waits for his sister Judith to take him trick or treating. His mother also yells for Judith to tend to her brother as she is about to leave for work. However, the latter has no intention of taking Michael out. Just as their mom leaves, Judith's boyfriend Stephen comes over and they go upstairs to have some fun. This leaves Michael all alone and upset, so he goes out donning his mask. But he comes back after a while and finds his mother's boyfriend Ronnie sleeping on a chair. This is just the right opportunity for the devilish child to exact his revenge. In a moment of madness, he ties the man to the chair with duct tape and finishes him off with a butcher knife. A while later, Judith's boyfriend Steve comes downstairs to make some sandwiches in the kitchen. Seeing him, Michael takes an aluminum bat and strikes him across the back of the head. Steve falls to the floor twitching and Michael watches him for a moment before continuing to hit him until he is dead. Michael's next move shows him going upstairs and discovering his sister Judith dozing out in her room. He takes off his clown mask and wears Steve's big white pasty Halloween mask. At the same time, Judith turns around as he runs his fingertips along her leg. She gets agitated to see Michael in her room and demands to know what he is doing. When he doesn't respond, she slaps him in the head. Filled with rage, Michael stabs his own sister in the stomach and kills her. When his mother ultimately returns from work, she discovers him sitting on the front porch with his infant sister in his arms. She frantically inquires why he is out on the porch so late. Michael stays silent while police sirens can be heard in the background. The following day, Michael is convicted of first-degree murder and imprisoned in the mental hospital under the care of Dr. Loomis. 
Despite the cold murders, Michael pretends to be innocent claiming that he doesn't remember anything. Every week Deborah pays him a visit, but Michael seems to be growing worse. Several months pass and he continues to lie to the doctors. During one session with Dr. Loomis, Michael shows him the new mask he made for himself. He claims that he dons this mask to cover up his ugly. One day, his mother visits him after a long time and tries to talk to him. However, Michael is silent and more isolated than ever. She shows him an old photo of him and his infant sister in an effort to cheer him up and advises him to hang it in his room. But the evil boy continues to remain silent. After the appointment, Dr. Loomis leads Michael to a nurse's care while Deborah exits the sanitarium. This turns out to be a bad idea, as when the two are alone, Michael becomes aggressive and stabs the nurse to death with a fork. After a while, Deborah and the doctor find out about the incident and become speechless. In particular Deborah is utterly distraught, now that she has seen what her son is truly capable of. Later, she returns home and watches old films of Michael from when he was just a small innocent kid. She tearfully reminisces about the olden days, and wonders if she was a bad mother. In the end, she commits the unthinkable unable to bear the pain anymore. The movie then jumps to 15 years later. Michael is now a towering man, who still remains locked up in the sanitarium. He hasn't spoken a word since his last murder and spends most of his time making masks. Dr. Loomis has also given up on treating him and instead published a best-selling book in which he labels Michael as an unredeemable evil. One night, Michael is busy making masks when two janitors arrive in his cell and start having their way with a female inmate. Michael doesn't react a bit and keeps doing his work. But once the janitors are done, he gets up grabs one of them and slams him against the table. Michael then goes over to the other one and beats him up several times before slamming his head against the wall. The commission alerts the guard, Ismail, who had been taking care of Michael ever since he was a child. Soon after, Ismail arrives at the cell block and discovers two distinct bloodied bodies scattered over the floor. As soon as he sees Michael, he immediately realizes what has transpired. He tries to lead the monster back to his cell, but the latter brutally punishes him and finishes him off with a television set. Following the massacre, Michael flees from the asylum, ready to cause more havoc. In the next scene, he arrives at a truck stop and gets into a fight with a driver. He bashes the driver several times against the wall, eventually killing him. Michael then steals the driver's overalls and discards his own. By the next morning, which is one Halloween day, Michael has returned to his family home in Haddonfield. The place remains abandoned since his mother's demise. Once there, he retrieves his favorite butcher knife and mask. In the meantime, we are introduced to Laurie Strode, an exemplary college student from Haddonfield. One day, she is instructed by her father, who is a real estate agent to deliver some papers at the previous Myers residence which is Michael's home. It turns out that her father is trying to sell the old Myers home, which the locals believe to be haunted. As asked, Lori drops off the paperwork there and departs. But to her misfortunate, Michael sees her and becomes curious. He then follows her to college and creeps on her. Here, we get to know that Lori is often lonely and she spends most of her time babysitting a neighbor 10-year-old boy. On the contrary her best friends, Linda and Annie, are more popular and loved throughout the school. Later that Halloween night, Annie convinces Lori to watch her kid, James, so that she and her boyfriend can have some fun. On the other hand, Linda joins her partner for a party at the former Myers residence. Michael who also happens to be there notices the couple and creeps on them. When Linda's boyfriend goes to relieve himself, Michael attacks him and kills him on the spot. He then goes ahead and finishes off Linda as well. After this, Michael makes his way to Lori's house, where he murders her parents as soon as she departs for her babysitting job. His reign of terror doesn't stop there as he makes his way to Annie's house where she is having fun with her boyfriend. Michael brutally finishes off the ladder and then forces himself onto Annie. 
After a few hours, Lori arrives there with James and discovers the traumatic scene. Annie is shaking profusely in a complete undressed state while her boyfriend's body hangs from the ceiling. Suddenly, Michael appears at the premises and starts attacking Lori. The latter somehow manages to flee, but he soon follows her and ambushes her. Meanwhile, Michael's escape has been reported to Dr. Loomis. He frantically comes over to Haddonfield and begs the local sheriff to acknowledge that Michael Myers has returned and is dangerous. The sheriff immediately calls Lori to ask about her whereabouts, but she doesn't pick up. Then after a bit of digging around, he finally gets to know the truth. It turns out that Lori is Michael's sister and that she was adopted when Deborah committed the unthinkable. The doctor realizes that Michael is aware of this truth, which is why he has been creeping on Lori. Fearing that she may be the next victim the doctor then makes the ultimate decision to visit the Myers residence. Meanwhile, we learn that Lori is still alive, but she is being held captive. The psychopath drops his knife and hands her a picture of the two of them when they were little. But Lori doesn't seem to understand or reminisce about anything as she was just an infant. While he is not looking, she manages to stab Michael in the neck and flee into the backyard. However, it merely affects his bulky body. Lori is then pursued by her psychopath brother, who eventually catches her in the empty pool. Thankfully, the doctor shows up at the right time and begs Michael repeatedly to stop. When this doesn't work, he shoots the psychopath multiple times in the back. After this the doctor and Lori try to flee, but Michael miraculously gets up breaks the windshield and yanks her out of the car. He is about to finish her off but the doctor starts begging him to release her. Surprisingly, Michael gives in and hands Lori over to him. But the next second, he grabs the doctor and brutally kills him by gouging out his eyes. As all this is happening, Lori grabs the nearby gun and flees upstairs. The psychopath also follows her and eventually corners her on a balcony. He then tackles her through the window and they both end up falling over the railing. A while later, Lori awakens on top of an unconscious Michael. She then points the gun at him and fires a shot, but he suddenly wakes up and grabs her wrist. Despite this, Lori remains undeterred and fires several more shots at him. The movie ends as Lori, who is covered in the psychopath's blood, screams hysterically. Michael Myers is finally dead.